Okay. Okay, so we've got about six minutes before we start. So uh, we just, uh, I'll just mute myself. 
Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, my name is Mario Novelli. I'm the director of the Centre for International Education at the University of Sussex and co-PI of the Peer Network. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, to week three of the Peer Network lecture series, The Political Economy of Education in Times of Conflict, Crisis and Pandemic. Um, uh, this is a GCRF uh, uh, AHRC funded network between the Centre for International Education, the University of Sussex, the University of Cape Town, Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan and the University of Ulster, uh, which aims to promote engagement with critical political economy analysis of education in context of conflict and crisis. Um, the lecture series is also supported by UCFIET, the UK Forum on International Education and Training, uh, all lectures are live streamed through YouTube and available afterwards and will become part of a free open source resource for all those interested in learning and sharing knowledge and practice about the political economy of education. And I encourage all of you to sign up to uh, the CIE YouTube page. Um, today's session is led by uh, Tony Verger and Clara Fondevilla from the University Autónoma de Barcelona and is focused on the political economy of education privatization in times of crisis. Um, before I introduce them, I just wanted to briefly run through a few housekeeping rules and logistics. Um, first of all, please could you all mute yourselves unless you're asking a question in the Q&A. Um, please, uh, as you listen to the speakers, please ask any questions during the talk through the chat function, and I will collate those and come back later to request uh, for you to ask the questions. Um, they will talk for around 35 to 40 minutes, and we will then have a seven minute Sussex buzz in small breakout rooms so that you can reflect on the content of the lecture uh, and issues that have been raised. And then we can come back uh, for a plenary question and answer session uh, for the last time and we'll try to prompt uh, we'll try to finish promptly at 2 15 pm uh, uk time um, so i'd just like to introduce the speakers today clara von de villa is a doctoral researcher at the department of sociology at the university autonoma de barcelona with a research focus on the negotiation of the post 2015 global education agenda and the development of associated global learning metrics her areas of interest are education markets, education international development, and the global governance of education. And in the past, Clara has participated in a range of research projects, including a systematic review on the political economy of education privatization reforms, and a study on the role, on the role of the World Bank in shaping the promotion of teacher reforms, and also research on low fee private schools in Peru. Dr. Anthony Verger, is an associate professor at the Department of Sociology, also at the University Autónoma de Barcelona. His research focuses on the study of the relationship between global governance institutions and education policy. That is how education policies are internationally disseminated and enacted in concrete institutional settings <coughs> and it has on education quality and equity. In recent years, he has specialized in the study of public-private partnerships and accountability policies in education. With cross-disciplinary training in sociology and education, Dr. Verger publishes in comparative education, education policy, sociology and development studies journals. He's one of the lead editors of the World Yearbook of Education and the Journal of Education Policy. And currently he coordinates the uh, ERC funded project Reform Ed, Reforming Schools Globally, a multi-scalar analysis of autonomy and accountability policies in the education sector. Um, I should say uh, that I've had a long-standing academic relationship with many colleagues at the University of Autónoma de Barcelona, many really excellent sociologists of education and fantastic doctoral students and uh, master's students. And it's a real pleasure today to welcome Anthony and Clara here and to thank them for their willingness to be part of what is turning out to be a really fascinating lecture series uh, that is reaching a lot of people around the world, both live and also later a uh, few many views on YouTube. So I'll now give the floor to Clara and Anthony and stop the sharing of my screen. Okay, and I start the sharing of my screen. So. <laughs> Yeah, 
Thank you, first of all, Mario, for the invitation to this lecture series and, and, to, and to the center that you, you coordinate for hosting us today, to, to me and, and Clara. Um, we are going to talk about how periods of crisis of a different nature are conducive to educational policy change and to education privatization in, in particular. So in the next uh, 30 minutes, uh, we are going to, to first um, justify theoretically the relevance of this, of this topic and, and the mechanism of crisis as a, as a moment of, of policy, policy change. I, I will also introduce the framework of our research. And then we will present our main results the, um, in the form of three different illustrative uh, episodes of how uh, different types of uh, crises are conducive to educational reforms that promote, let's say, um, market approaches to, to education, education privatization, and so on and so forth. Basically, we will focus on the role of natural disasters, um, conflict, and post-conflict uh, settings in, in particular, and economic crisis and, and, uh, and the role of let's say, um, economic and vulnerability uh, of some countries when it comes to, to generate an environment that is conducive to this type of educational reforms uh, pro privatization. And then we will conclude by highlighting some common features and enabling mechanisms between these different episodes. So to start with, I would like to, well, I will start um, by presenting these first parts and then Clara von de Villa will, will follow, okay? So this uh, area of research has been very well theorized from, from very different uh, perspectives. So we find here very macro level accounts such as the disaster capitalism approach of Naomi Klein uh, who shows very fam famously and in a, in a media approach sometimes how, um, how crisis uh, and the doctrine of shocks are, are conducive to these or create opportunities for radical both economic but also social uh, reforms. This is a topic that has been also theorized by uh, historical institutionalists as you probably know, historical institutionalism tends to, to highlight uh, reproduction and gradual, um, gradual change, but at, uh, sometimes they identify what they call critical junctures as key moments of radical transformations. And also cultural political economy as a both theoretical and heuristic approach is, um, is a very let's say, useful, at least for us, um, perspective to understand institutional change. And in this, um, this perspective invites us to identify how the moment of variation, together with the moments of selection and, and re retention, understood as evolutionary mechanisms, are uh, key moments of, uh, or decisive moments for, for policy change. And actually, um, despite most uh, crises or periods of crisis have a, a material base, uh, both political, economic, uh, natural catastrophes, and, and so on, it's important to, to highlight that the reasons or the problems behind these, these crises and also the solutions to these problems are socially constructed. So, here is important to also identify um, meaning making and semiotic factors as a, an essential component to understand uh, crises as mechanisms of, of, policy, of policy change. So in this particular um, research or presentation, we are going to focus uh, on how crises are let's say conducive to the generation of uh, education privatization 
or the adoption of market policies in, in education. What we are going to tell you about uh, comes from a broader research, a systematic literature review that we did uh, together with Clara and our colleague Adrián Zancajo from the University of Glasgow, in which we identified different pathways toward education privatization. Um, these are pathways of a uh, very different uh, nature, as you can see in this uh, table, which go from the most drastic, radical, uh, neoliberal reforms in which the role of the state in education is being transformed, uh, education privatization in social democratic states, um, scaling up privatization as a most uh, moderate and less drastic form of educational privatization, de facto privatization in low income countries, historical public private partnerships, and also privatization by way of catastrophes. So these are, as I said, different pathways towards education privatization in, in nature. And actually, when we talk about the role of crisis in education privatization reforms, we're going to focus mostly on two of these um, pathways, which are called de facto privatization in low income countries and privatization by way of catastrophes. Especially the last one, I think is um, not very present in the literature and actually as, uh, as a privatization event in many contexts, but we think that it has a lot of qualities that make it very different from the other pathways, reason why we decided to um, highlight this pathway uh, at the same level of, of the others. Um, so maybe it's not so quantitative, uh, quantitatively relevant as is qualitatively uh, relevant. But as you will see, it has its own logics and, and dynamics. So this literature review very briefly uh, comes from more than 200 uh, research uh, pieces that were published between the years 99 and 2015. So basically we focused on education privatization at primary and secondary education because we consider that actually the logics and mechanisms of privatization in higher education Tibet are also of a different nature. So we focused on what is known sometimes as, as basic as basic education, and we combined um, both literature coming from academic uh, databases with, with gray literature. And mostly the pieces that we reviewed focused um, on, on the political economy of education privatization. We know that there is a lot of literature on, okay, what are the effects of education privatization for equity, learning outcomes, but here we wanted to focus on literature that um, the main objective of this uh, research is to find out what are the drivers behind education privatization uh, reforms and, and changes. So in a way, um, the idea of this presentation is to try to, to capture this relationship between a context of crisis that might be related to questions of economic vulnerability, state fragility, um, humanitarian emergency, political conflict, and natural catastrophes, and what we um, call privatization policies that cover different types of policies and reforms, such as uh, voucher schemes, charter schools, subsidies to private schools, and also some forms of endogenous privatization, such as school-based management. Okay, and actually the research that we have done on this topic has a, a very much uh, comparative approach. And in the discussion, we will reflect on what are the common attributes and drivers and enabling mechanisms of this type of uh, crisis-driven um, reforms. Okay, so say this, I will start with the first episode and then from there, Clara will take over. So 
the first episode is what we call education privatization in the wake of natural disasters. And here probably the um, empirical case study that has been uh, more extensively analyzed is the, um, the educational reform, the pro-charter um, educational reform that follow the, um, the Katrina hurricane that, um, that happened in New Orleans in the United States in the year 2005. It was a, a hurricane that killed uh, 2,000 people, but also displaced many, many people. And actually, as you will see, the fact that there was an urgency to reconstruct the educational system um, was seen as an opportunity by many um, educational policy entrepreneurs to, to advance uh, a charter school uh, reform. Actually, in Louisiana, um, before the Katrina happened, there were different attempts to promote market uh, reforms, including a voucher bill that was unsuccessful. But the um, recovery school district, school district that was created after uh, Katrina um, contributed to the fragmentation of the educational system, an educational system that was very much um, uh, monopolized almost by public uh, schools, moved from 112 public schools to uh, 37 public schools, and the number of charter schools increased uh, drastically only in five years from eight to 51. So, as I said, um, uh, an educational system that was very homogeneous uh, became very fragmented with this type of reorganization. So then we found in the system public schools managed by the local board, public schools managed, managed by, by state level bodies, and the same with charter schools. So there were more charter schools supervised by the local board and the state level uh, body. So what were the enabling uh, circumstances? So there was um, the Katrina generated a, a critical juncture in which the power relations were drastically altered in the sense that, for instance, key education stakeholders were actually physically displaced, including some teacher union leaders. Um, because of the urgency of the, of, the, of the situation, what was a tradition of community participation in education reform deliberation didn't happen. So the traditional decision-making stru structures were dismantled and decisions were taken more quickly. And actually these decisions were uh, taken by taking into account the voices of uh, new players or players that were there, but um, their influence was not as important as, uh, as after the Katrina crisis. So for instance, different think tanks or philanthropic organizations that actually operated at the federal level saw an opportunity in empowering local pro-market um, education reform movements. We are thinking here about the Heritage Foundation or the Urban Institute that were especially active in this post Katrina episode. And even Milton Friedman uh, wrote an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal in which literally uh, called for uh, or saw the Katrina as an opportunity to radically reform the system. So these were his own words. Um, so this idea of, okay, Katrina is an opportunity to radically uh, reform the, the system and to introduce more choice, more um, charter schools, et cetera, et cetera, which is what ended, ended happening. And of course, uh, one of the characteristics of these reforms is that they are very difficult to reverse once the situation of, or when the state or the city reaches a situation of normality because you have created uh, a new set of rules, new stakeholders, a new economic and educational interest on both the offer and the demand and the demand sides. So as I said, the post-Katrina 
uh, pro-charter school reform is the most well documented case, but there are other um, education privatization reforms in the wake of natural disasters that have been also document documented. For instance, the, um, in, in Honduras, there was um, a hurricane very strong also affecting all the region of Central America in the year 1998, the Hurricane Mitch, which was um, an opportunity for, for the um, adoption of uh, school-based management uh, reform funded by the, by the World Bank. In Haiti, more recently, there was a very strong earthquake that destroyed uh, literally the, um, the school infrastructure. So a group of a network of international donors promoted uh, a reform that consisted on the adoption of a voucher scheme that meant the expansion of um, private provision that was already very high, the level of private actors in the educational system in Haiti. But after the reform, this, um, this change become more, more drastic. And more recently, there is no a lot of literature yet, but there was a hurricane affecting Puerto Rico. And uh, after the hurricane, there was a um, the adoption of a pro-charter school legislation in a very similar way to what we observed for, for the case of, of New Orleans. But as I say, this is a very uh, recent episode. Uh, Hurricane Maria is from 2017 and, and research is still being conducted on, uh, on the political economy of this particular reform. So Clara, the floor is yours. Clara, the microphone is muted. <laughs> Sorry, um, let me go again. Uh, so uh, thanks, Tony. Um, so just like uh, in the case of natural uh, disasters, we can, the literature also uh, suggests that conflict settings or uh, probably post-conflict settings are also um, fertile uh, ground for the advancement of uh, market reforms, typically under the pretense or the, the guise of development aid, reconst reconstruction or variations thereof. So uh, part of uh, the reason for this is that um, the situation of vulnerability of these states make them particularly permeable to um, actors willing to test privatization policies. And in fact, bringing private providers in a context in which the state uh, is uh, weak, uh, is perceived as weak uh, or divided by conflict is perceived as a more legitimate uh, course of action than, um, than in normal circumstances. So first case that illustrates very well these dynamics and that has been uh, uh, intensively uh, documented, uh, especially by the work, uh, the work of Brent Edwards, for instance, is the case of uh, El Salvador. Um, El Salvador was immersed in a uh, civil war uh, between 1980 and 1992. Uh, and this uh, proved a um, a uh, helpful basis for, the system, uh, for a system-wide education reform in which a school-based management program known as EDUCO, for its acronym in Spain, um, featured uh, prominently. So EDUCO is a school-based ma school management program in which um, uh, groups of parents are made responsible for the management of the school and, for instance, they are required to contract teachers on a, a one-year uh, contracts and so on. So it introduces uh, very basic market mechanisms in the education system. So uh, what is interesting of the Salvadorian case is that this program, which was um, agreed as part of a World Bank loan, um, this World Bank loan was um, um, approved um, in the year 1991, and that is one year before the uh, peace uh, agreements of 1992. So let's say that the situation of democratic void um, make it easier for the advance of such a, uh, of a, what was a kind of drastic uh, reform. Also, in fact, the, uh, the role of the World Bank is very relevant in this case, because uh, the World Bank, through the conditional conditionalities attached to a series of loans, uh, exerted a particularly power influence in the Salvadorian education policy during the 90s. And also it allowed for the uh, crucial input of two uh, US supported foundations known as uh, FUSADES and uh, FEPADES for uh, their acronym in Spain. These were conservative um, and market-oriented market uh, think tanks and foundations respectively. 
And uh, they uh, pressed or pushed for more radical education reforms. In fact, initially, they uh, suggested to introduce a voucher scheme. However, when the, the idea was deemed um, unfeasible, largely as a consequence of the resistance of the teacher union, they finally, along with the World Bank, settled for the, for the EDUCO scheme, which is interesting, uh, interestingly enough, um, it, was, it grew out of, uh, of our community, um, community education uh, initiative um, encouraged by UNICEF and UNESCO. However, what the EDUCO program did was to redesign the uh, community education program, emphasizing the managerial aspects and uh, the emphasizing um, all the uh, emanci emancipatory potential of the program. In any case, this is a good example of the, um, uh, the powerful, uh, uh, the power of a democratic void as the one created by a, a situation of um, civil war or conflict. So uh, other examples are beyond the EDUCO case and, and are, uh, for instance, the one, um, the reconstruction of the education system in the in post-war uh, Iraq. Um, it has been documented by some authors like Kenneth Salman and others that uh, one of uh, particularly uh, US supported uh, for-profit organization known as Creative Associates International played a key role in redesigning the reconstruction of the education system. Uh, and encourage uh, not only decentralization, but also charter schools and a series of reforms modeled on uh, American programs. And a more recent example um, is the one documented by Francine Menashi and uh, Zina Zakaria regarding the uh, education program, programs for Syrian refugees. And these uh, authors have drawn attention to the um, rise of the private sector in this kind of programs and the potential a uh, surge of private schools, sometimes uh, fee-paying private schools that could uh, expand at the expenses of uh, public, uh, public provision in these spaces. So this is uh, a third example of the, this, the potential of this kind of uh, conflict settings. Um, this, um, so this is a second uh, illustrative episode of the potential of crisis. And then the third one is uh, the case of low-income countries, that is uh, countries affected by a situation of a state fragility, which translates not only in a situation of budgetary restrictions, but also limited administrative capacity and so on. So what uh, it has been documented that in a series of low income countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and the south of Asia, there has been a growth uh, proliferation of low fee private schools that initially uh, were created by local entrepreneurs. Uh, and because this is a spontaneous phenomenon that uh, takes place at the margins of the state, at least initially, this is typically known as grassroots privatization or bottom-up uh, privatization. However, the key, uh, the key idea here is that this is not a phenomenon that occurs in a vacuum, but in fact, this has to do with the role of the state or the absence of a state role. So basically, the, um, the success of these uh, locally initiated schools have to do with an unmet educational demand that uh, in turn is a product of the limited capacity of the state um, to expand education, uh, the educational offer. So what, uh, what happens more uh, precisely is that, uh, especially uh, after the abolition of a school fees, um, system expanded uh, in a very rapid way and without the necessary um, administrative and economic support. So some families, in order to avoid what was perceived as uh, overcrowded classrooms and under supported uh, schools, they uh, turned or um, developed this preference for private schools. And in fact, the very underinvestment in public schools feeds or reinforces the belief on the superiority of the uh, private sector in terms of quality. Um, so the very emergence of uh, low fee private schools has to do with a situation of chronic uh, crisis, to put it some way, that creates or encourages this demand for private options. But uh, maybe it's more interesting the fact that the very consolidation and institutionalization of the low fee private school model, again, has to do with uh, this situation of crisis, which can be instrumentalized it, um, or mobilized it by external partners to legitimize the low fee private school option as a policy option. So, uh, Tony, if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, so, um, different authors have, have documented that uh, recently low private schools uh, have uh, expanded and consolidated, sometimes, for instance, in the form of low fee private school chains. So, what had initially emerged as the product of a local entrepreneurship finally becomes a scaled up operation. And in other, uh, in other uh, countries, 
um, uh, uh, governments have been recommended to include low fee private schools in public uh, in PPP schemes in order to make sure that everyone has access to these schools, regardless of the um, economic power of the family. And again, uh, these kind of uh, options, which uh, entail basically a consolidation of the low fee private school model, uh, have been uh, defended on the grounds that is a, it is a way of um, overcoming the situation of a state fragility. Sometimes the tendency of the state or the difficulty of the state to control for corrupt practices at the local level, also as a cost efficient measure in a context of uh, budgetary um, restrictions and so on. Uh, uh, an example of the key role of these external partners in legitimizing and promoting this option is the case of the World Bank, which uh, in a series of um, flagship reports, especially during the uh, 2010s, the, the past decade, uh, they supported this option. And even so in recent publication, they, they have uh, moved away um, and are less, far less enthusiastic on, on the potential of low fee private schools. The, the key part here is that the uh, financial support to private um, partners um, can continue even when the rhetorical support disappears. So we'll see what happens in the next future, in the near future. The support to the low fee private school model, uh, model has also uh, been promoted by some bilateral agencies and with the material support of multinational corporations that have put the initial investments for the creation of low fee private school chains, for instance. So again, this uh, shared support for the model has been um, articulated in a, in a series of networks and spaces in which this idea of the potential of, of the private sector as a way to overcome a situation of a state vulner vulnerability has uh, consolidated. Uh, and uh, maybe an illustri illustrative example of this has been the case of um, Liberia, um, in which uh, Liberia is, a, uh, is one of the poorest countries in Africa. And in addition, it was uh, struck by uh, a 14 year civil war. And more recently, um, it was uh, severely affected by the uh, Ebola outbreak. So in a situation of very low fee uh, enrollment figures and also very low literacy figures, uh, the idea of outsourcing a number of public schools to private providers um, gain attractiveness within government cycle, uh, circles. Um, I think there is the next slide. Thanks. Um, so uh, it was in, uh, in the year 2016 that the Partnership Schools for Liberia project was initiated. It was basically a large scale PPP in which uh, some private providers uh, get uh, per, student, per student subsidies to run uh, their own schools while the government is still paid for the teacher's salaries. Uh, again, the situation in which this idea of uh, um, vulnerability, uh, of um, extreme hardship uh, um, was used as a means to legitimize uh, what is a, a kind of radical or drastic change in the Liberian school landscape. It is again interesting to see that, uh, again, the role of external uh, international foundations uh, has been key. Uh, one of uh, a particular um, research institution in the United States was tasked with the monitoring and evaluation of the program. And more in general, uh, the Liberia space has become a sort of testing ground to discuss the potential and the pros and cons of the charter school model. Uh, so uh, that said, um, we will move to the last section of the presentation. And we, would, uh, we will try to identify the main um, enabling circumstances and mechanisms that make possible this uh, uh, connection between crisis and privatization, and also more general features of this kind of uh, crisis in this in dust um, um, privatization. So uh, to start with, uh, to start with, we observe that this episode is uh, of crisis that we have uh, documented or or um, are characterized by a kind of very rap uh, rapid pace. So it's a sequence of an accelerated change. And this um, allows for a rapid change, basically because in, especially in a context of disaster or a time bound uh, catastrophe, um, basically we observe the elimination of the uh, regular, regulatory and institutional obstacles that would generally um, demand a more, um, uh, a deliberative process. Also, it creates a situation of democratic void in which resistance or even opposition uh, is a scarce and uh, very heavily penalized, uh, largely as a consequence of this narrative of the need uh, to act rapidly and uh, to um, reconstruct the system, the, the general sense of urgency 
makes it very difficult uh, for the opposition forces to really oppose this kind of policies because it's seen as an irresponsible move in some ways. Uh, so basically this allows uh, to sideline the typical um, deliberation opportunities that would to take place in a normal process of policy change. Uh, also, second feature of uh, this kind of episode is that uh, there is a sort of reconfiguration of the power field. This is so because uh, there is a marginalization or sidelining of the traditional stakeholders and uh, veto players. Again, this has to do with uh, what I was commenting about the role of opposition, that uh, not only um, it is um, heavily penalized if they oppose the change, but in fact, sometimes, as Tony was commenting, are simply display displaced or scattered across the country or um, the region. So it's difficult to uh, organize on some sort of uh, organized resistance. And in addition, um, and as I think most of the episodes uh, have made it clear, this kind of um, processes make it possible for external actors, for instance, actors operating, uh, operating at a higher level, at a federal level or at a global level, it makes it easier for these kind of agents to provide input and even to um, determine the outcome of the process of policy change. This is something that in a situation of normality would be more difficult because again, there are uh, certain um, obstacles that made it difficult for these external injuries. But in these situations, uh, it's simply more easier and even uh, perceived as a legitimate option as a valid one. So basically, uh, these kind of situations create a sort of unscrutinized the space uh, favorable to external influence or that make uh, countries or cities particularly permeable to this kind of uh, influence. So um, a third um, relevant mechanism or uh, idea is that uh, it's interesting to know that in all these episodes, there is a very um, explicit uh, narrative effort to um, frame the situation of crisis and disaster in terms of opportunity. So um, as Tony was uh, commenting at the start of the presentation, even if uh, disasters and crises, economic crises or um, whatever, have a very physical dimension or a material dimension, they need to be constructed um, in a way um, conducive to the advancement of market reforms. And this is why the role of uh, think tanks uh, and uh, the media and policy entrepreneurs and so on is so important because there is, uh, there is the need to uh, construct this as an opportunity. And we see that uh, met metaphors like this idea of uh, silver lining and the golden opportunity, the bright spot, are recurrent themes that appear in most of these episodes. Um, the fourth uh, characteristic is that um, most of these episodes, even if um, initially start in a, a very constrained place, typically they uh, end up having an impact elsewhere. So what they start, for instance, as a local experience, as in the case of the reform in New Orleans, eventually becomes a model that is used in other cities. For instance, in uh, other states of the United States, like uh, Georgia, they have decided to experiment with these recovery districts. Um, and more in general, it has been a way of legitimizing the charter school idea as uh, potentially helpful. Um, similarly, uh, with the case of uh, the EDUCO program in El Salvador, it became uh, the model or the blueprint for other school-based management experiences um, in other places, initially in, the, in Central America and finally in other uh, countries. So it is on the basis of EDUCO that the school-based management became a sort of uh, global best practice as promoted by the World Bank. So basically, the idea here is that um, even what starts in a very in a context affected by crisis ends up extending uh, extending elsewhere, or has the potential to eventually extend elsewhere. And closely connected to this, um, there is in fact a certain logic of irreversibility. So even if uh, initially these kind of um, drastic reforms are um, are accepted um, as a quick response, as a sometimes as even a temporal response to a situation of uh, disaster, the need to act uh, fast, quickly and so on, it, they are difficult to uh, reverse over time because uh, they create this structure of incentives uh, in which um, many actors uh, have an incentive to um, retain this policy option. So they tend to endure over time. However, uh, as different episodes have shown, um, they are not impossible to reverse. And in fact, this is probably something uh, worth uh, exploring more in depth. So there is a uh, scope for uh, resistance probably. And uh, I think that's all. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, Clara and uh, Tony, for what I think was a really, really rich, uh, well-explained, uh, provocative uh, um, review of some of this relationship between crisis and uh, um, privatization and, uh, you know, really, really relevant to some of the issues I think that we're all facing uh, around the world now. Um, I'm going to now suggest that just for a few minutes, um, we move to breakout rooms just for participants to have a chance to reflect in a small group uh, some of the issues that come up, some of the questions that you might like to raise in the Q&A. So I'm just going to... Um, uh, assign people to breakout room and uh, I'll call you back in seven minutes.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, I hope that these, uh, the breakout rooms managed to function okay and you had a chance to, um, to raise a few issues uh, uh, with colleagues. Um, so I'm gonna open the floor now to uh, questions and I'm going to start um, with reading out uh, a question from Peter Har Larsen, uh, just because his mic is not working today. So I'm just gonna read that one out to you. Um, how much does the global governance and standard setting organizations, networks, funds like education clusters, uh, INEE, et cetera, help to raise the alarm or on the contrary, to aid further the growing role of private actors and what could and should be the role of these institutions and the United Nations, Global Partnership for Education, World Bank, etc. cetera. Um, that's the first question. I'm gonna take three questions to begin with and then allow you a chance to respond and then come back with uh, further questions. Um, so the next question is coming from Anya Cowley. Would you like to ask your question, Anya? Are you still there? Uh, no, uh, okay, um, I'll read that one. Um, most alarming is the, uh, no, sorry. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm Anya, education advisor at Save the Children. UK, based on lessons around education privatization in natural disasters and post-conflict settings, what are the key things we must keep in mind in the education emergency response to COVID-19? There could be a risk of proliferation of private sector actors partnerships due to the global economic downturn and reduced investment in education, both domestically and in ODA. Um, and then finally, the third question is coming from Kathy. And I'm going to let Cathy speak for herself as uh, she couldn't get on last week. So uh, let's have a live performance. Well, thank you. There is a question before me, but they actually relate. Thank you very much. I learned a good deal from this presentation, but I was very alarmed by the range of crises and the logic of irreversibility that you found, although you did kindly add a question mark, and I, uh, I noticed that Nimi Hoffman is also asking about pushback, uh, as, as my colleagues put it in the breakout group. What is the point of no return, and where are the places for a little return, a little pushback against privatization? Thanks. Okay, uh, over to you two. You're both muted. So, Tony, you're muted. Clara, I think you're muted if you unmute. Yeah. Clara, do you want me to start and then you go on? Uh, sure. Because I think that all of us can say a few things about these three great um, questions. So, thank you very, very much. Um, yeah, the role of international players. I think that is different. Um, so the, the situations that we were describing are very are very different, and maybe we haven't referred so much in, in relation to the first questions to emergency emergency situations and displaced population. Probably in these situations, any uh, type of provision is welcome, and if it's a private NGO provision, is totally understandable because. Of course, um, the nation state of the refugee population is, is very unclear which one is. And if the, um, the, the state where people is displaced is not offering anything, any, any solution to the displaced uh, or to the refugees, I think that an NGO alternative uh, or an international organization alternative needs to be welcome, if I'm, even if it's from an idea fund or something like this, because the right to education is is first, and and then I I think that the situation that we were describing are are, are also very different. I think is is especially concerning the situation in low income countries because under the argument that some of these states don't have the resources, don't have the capacity to to offer uh, good quality public education then education privatization advances which of course generates a spillover effect and of course the public sector will never be able to uh, 
to generate a public alternative and in 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 relation to 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 some of the international organizations that you mentioned very recently the global partnership for education approved uh, a strategy to engage with a private sector that was very very controversial was written by um by, by a consultant that is very supportive of private solutions and the constituency of the civil society of the GP was very concerned. And in the end, uh, after a campaign of lobby, civil society was able to remove the possibility of the GP supporting for profit lofi private schools. But it's true that, um, that the GP now uh, is able to support private lofi private schools and also as a word of caution is very difficult to to distinguish what does it mean private for profit and non for profit in in the education sector so this was a maybe a small victory but uh, we don't know what will be the implications of this of this yet um and of course covid is um is uh, another um, another episode of crisis and of course, because it's so recent, we haven't analyzed it yet, but other colleagues like Anna Hogan or Ben Williamson have started working on, on this topic. And I think that here, what we will witness is not necessarily an expansion of private education provision or private schooling, but um, an increasing penetration of the ed tech industry and more commercialization uh, of educational uh, private services within the public school domain. So all these learning platforms that have proliferated in the context of uh, homeschooling uh, are probably one of the most important private uh, commercial service that is penetrating um, penetrating the, um, the public educational uh, systems, sometimes with a lot of public funding or sometimes with a lot of private funding because the families themselves are those that are contracting this type of, of services with, uh, whose effectiveness is not proven yet. So um, this is uh, also something that is concerning, the fact that, okay, everybody considers that this is a, a lesser evil uh, in a situation of absence of um, or in a situation of disrupted public provision, but um, we don't know if the, um, the investment that we are doing in this type of platforms is, is, really, is really worth. And maybe uh, Casey had this comment on the no uh, pushback and of the, of the reforms and yeah, of course, there's a um, as we highlighted in the presentation, once you create uh, a private constituency with families um, using these services, and usually these private providers organize themselves in associations that become powerful lobbies, it's very difficult to dismantle this, but it's not impossible. So education privatization reforms are not linear. We have seen many countries in the world in which, okay, mm, mm, privatization trends have been reversed, sometimes because of uh, public policy, sometimes because of demographic trends. And in countries like Chile, for instance, after many years of a very hard market approach to, to educational provision, in 2015, there was uh, an educational reform being implemented to try to maybe not dismantle the market, but to, to, to reduce the, the, the externalities of the market, of schools trying to select the best uh, students or, or charging uncovered fees or not everybody having the same choice capacity. So, and this reform, of course, has been very much contested. Uh, Adrián Zancajo has done a very interesting work on, on the, political, uh, the political economy of this type of pro-equity, uh, pro-inclusion reform in a context of a very privatized educational system. And, and of course shows the resistance by the private players, families and so on. But 
the reforms at the same time have been able to, to, to advance in a more or less positive way. Uh, I don't know, Clara, if you want to uh, add anything or, or you take the next, the, the next questions. Yeah, uh, sure. No, I think that um, I don't want to add anything. But in relation to uh, the other uh, two questions that maybe in a way are related about the role and the scope for uh, resistance or opposition and the role of teachers union in particular, um, in fact, we have not extended on this because of um, time limitations, but uh, in different of these episodes, uh, there was uh, an important pushback on the part basically on teachers union, for instance, and it was a successful one. In the case of uh, New Orleans, um, the local teacher union or the local teachers unions um, fought against uh, a specific part of the reform, which basically deregulated uh, considerably the teacher profession. And through a law suite, uh, I mean, through the yeah, judicial action, uh, over the years, they succeeded in reversing uh, at least this particular component. And more in general, they were uh, instrumental in creating a sense of uh, concern around these reforms in uh, uh, highlighting and um, throwing light on the equity and accountability implications of the fragmentation of the New Orleans edu um, local education system. So uh, th there is, a, of course, a scope for resistance, but typically it, it takes some time. So again, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of rhythms, maybe. So catastrophes in particular are conducive to rapid change and resistance takes time. So it's difficult to simply um, put a, a stop it as it is happening, but of course, over the years, it's possible to, um, through advocacy work, through research work, uh, through industrial action, to do something. So that um, would be my point, uh, that in most of these episodes, there has been resistance with varying levels of, of success. Um, I don't know if I'm missing something right now. Uh, I, I know less about the case of Liberia that uh, Nim, uh, Nimi Hoffman, I think, <laughs> out. Um, I don't know much about it. I don't know that the teacher union had had uh, an important role um, and what has been the outcome of this. So. Okay, um, so I'm gonna, thank you. Uh, I will um, uh, give a floor to a few follow-up questions. So Nimi, if you want to ask any follow-up question on that, and then I have Moisa and Punam uh, and Susan Nikolai. Uh, so uh, do you want to go first, Nimi, or has your question been answered? It's been answered, thank you, Mario. Okay, brilliant. So uh, Moisa? Hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm a super interesting presentation and I'm really sorry it was a little bit late because I was coming in from a, a meeting. Um, I wondered, and I tried to address this, ask this question in my breakout room, and I think I was encouraged to raise it in the larger forum, is what kind of, what did you come across in terms of the, uh, the success of uh, low fee private models in terms of enrollment or quality in terms of learning outcomes? Or did you see any evidence of low fee private skill models over a particular period um, being scaled up or being mainstreamed into state? Uh, or, or is it too early to tell given the context you were exploring? But I, I, the reason why I wanna say that is because I think it's important to kind of like be able to say, yes, there is uh, there are process problems with what private school and what this growth means in terms of what we look forward as well as when we talk about public state provision and, and something like education. But I think we also wanna sort of say in the short term, what do they mean for things like enrollment, learning outcomes, quality of education? So it'd be really good to hear what you have or could point me towards in terms of evidence. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll, I'll take uh, Punam. Are you still with us? No, um, how about I go to Susan Nikolai? Sure, thanks, Mario. Um, I was wondering if any of the panelists came across anything at all in terms of ed tech um, providers. You know, they're typically private for profit um, providers, and, and their role in education pro um, provision in any of the crises examined. Thank you, Susan. Um, and 
Kunami is asking me to ask her question and I can't find it. Uh, do we see the possibility of direct confrontation discussion with the World Bank for limiting its interventions? Okay, so um, having gone through those, um, do you want to come back and respond? You want to go first, Clara, this time? Um, yep. So uh, if that's fine, Donny. Um, I will uh, start then with the question on lofty private schools. Uh, so in fact, we have not been um, in the context of the research um, doing research on the impact, but of course it's a, it's a very well researched theme. And I would say that it's difficult to give a, a question for all the countries. So it's a very, I mean, even the uh, institutional infrastructure of low-fee private schools differs across countries and their impact probably depends, I mean, depends uh, on the context, the exact um, segment of population that attends them. But in general terms, um, the evidence I'm aware of um, suggests that um, the quality is not immediately superior, but the kind of families and um, students attending them are different. And this explains, for instance, in the case of Liberia, the superior performance in terms of uh, this um, standardized test of, uh, of um, privately managed schools, for instance. So it's difficult because, again, uh, it's difficult to disentangle the family effect and the school effect. But um, if, I, if I had to summarize uh, the evidence I have come across, that would be the synthesis, but it's a very context-specific phenomenon as far as I know. So maybe uh, you don't want to answer the one on the education technology. Yeah, no, re regarding Susan Nicolai's uh, question, as I say, in our, in our review, um, it didn't pop up. Uh, also, because I think that the last year that we covered was 2015, but I am sure that if we um, reproduced the same search now, we would find much more on EdTech. And if you are interested in this topic, maybe the, the most complete mapping of, of the situation, especially in the context of post-COVID, um, has been produced by... Uh, Anne Hogan and, and Ben Williamson in this report by Education International that was released, I think, a, a few months ago. So, but yeah, I think that in our in our review, it, uh, it didn't pop up. And when it comes to the, um, the World Bank, um, there has been some civil society campaigns also asking um, uh, the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, to stop funding low-fee private schools. And I think that there has been some public relations uh, campaigns going on that uh, have been relatively successful. And I think that after so many years of criticism and research showing what Clara says, that um, private solutions are not, uh, are not totally effective or they generate a lot of uh, inequalities or uh, school segregation segmentation. I think that at least at the discursive level, uh, if, we're, if you read the, the last um, World Development Report, well, not the last one, but the last one dedicated to education in 2018, uh, we find a, a, a discourse of the, of the World Bank much more skeptical with um, what evidence says about, about supporting um, education privatization solutions, and hopefully this will translate in, in their lending operations at some point. Maria, your microphone. Sorry, <laughs> I was wondering why there was no response. Um, so uh, I missed a couple of questions. Uh, Sarbani Chakrabarti um, asked to ask a question. Do, are you with us? Yes, I am. I am here. Yeah. You fire away. Yeah, I just wanted to know that if there is an already existing schools, uh, private schooling system, which there is like uh, in places of South Asia, like in India and Pakistan and Nepal, 
we already have had this um, the uh, the relatively upper classes, um, you know, or <clears throat> relatively better off sections of the population have been going to uh, attending private schooling uh, since independence uh, almost. So um, what kind of push and pull factor uh, is that in terms of the formation of uh, low fee private schooling later uh, around, you know, which started basically more emphatically after 1995 or so? Could you, could you please um, respond to that? Yeah. And uh, next one is Jorge. No, I'll read it for you. Uh, does private education imply a contradiction with the broad formulation of liberal democratic educational goals? Having in mind, of course, the access restriction it implies. Okay, so there's a couple of questions there, uh, if you'd like to respond. You want to start, Clara, or? Yeah. Um... So uh, in relation to uh, these um, uh, certain uh, countries in uh, South Asia, which have historically had uh, a segment of a school of private schools well established, um, uh, uh, at least personally, I'm, I'm not particularly familiar with this elite, uh, elite segment of uh, schools, but maybe what is interesting of this country is that recently, um, and by recently, I mean maybe over the last two decades, but uh, to this um, historical sector, uh, we have uh, another one has added uh, this one, uh, which are private schools more affordable to the middle um, and, or uh, working class uh, in these countries, um, which has been typically uh, subsidized by the state. So um, basically, uh, the, the education landscape, the private education landscape in these countries is complicated. And, and of course, the fact that there is already a private segment probably makes things easier for the establishment or the expansion of the private sector, but it's a diversification. So it, um, it simply adds to uh, something that is uh, already there and that responds to a different uh, logic probably. I don't know if these are and, and that's the best thing. Yeah, I can yeah, respond to, to Jorge uh, in the sense that, yeah, this is interesting in the sense that, of course, and I remember we had some discussions uh, with Clara, Mauro Moschetti, and I think also Adrian in the context of the Abidjan uh, principles, because I don't know if you're familiar with the Abidjan principles are a series of principles that give recommendations to governments on how to regulate uh, private sector participation in educational systems in favor of equity, that's more or less. And it's true that it's very difficult to, to have universal guidelines because the nature of education privatization can be, can be very, very different. And some of the arguments of the promoters of these principles was, for instance, that in some authoritarian regimes, uh, maybe some private uh, schooling initiatives are desirable in the sense that they uh, promote liberal democratic principles, okay? But it's also true that in, in general, um, beyond the educational approach of uh, the private education sector, what we observe is that when there is um, public funding for private schools, Mm, most of these private schools tend to be sel socially selective. So if, and this happens in, in very well established public private partnerships in, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in, in Spain, not only in low income countries. So it's very difficult to, to regulate public private par partnerships in favor of, of equity. So, um, so my answer would be that from the point of view of educational access, is is true that uh, having a lot of private providers, even when they are publicly funded, uh, represent a, a challenge for for democratic access and an inclusive education. Any any final thoughts, Clara? Uh, no. Okay, I think, well, it, it's quarter past two. Uh, so I would just like to take a moment just to thank both Clara and Tony for what I think was a really excellent uh, um, presentation. And thank you all for some really stimulating questions. Uh, I think this discussion goes on uh, into, the next, uh, in, into the next week.
Um, next week's session um, is from our own uh, Yusuf Sayed uh, from the Center for International Education. And the title of that lecture is uh, Evidence in Education Policy Making in the Global South During COVID-19, Pundits, Social Movements and Policymakers in an Age of Unpredictability. Um, so looking forward to that next week, looking forward to seeing all of you again. And uh, please uh, don't worry about um, uh, a new link for next week. It's the same link for every week. So you can just uh, use the Zoom link and please uh, encourage your students or uh, colleagues to visit the YouTube site and to watch the previous lectures. Uh, and again, thanks all of you for your support in this lecture series. Uh, and uh, thanks to Tony and Clara for a wonderful uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.